Please Bye. welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Devi, for the wonderful slides and music. Uh, I'm Harpreet Mangat. I'm the executive director of Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative, and I welcome all of you to this very important talk today. Before we start the talk, I want to share the land acknowledgement with you all. We recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of Chochen Yu speaking Ohlone people. The successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to Muvek Mu Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous people. Thank you, David. So before we start, uh, I would like to request all of our uh, attendees to please uh, put your name uh, in the chat and tell us from where you are joining us. And if you want to share your connection to the theme today, that would be great. I want uh, Before we start, I want to tell you a little bit about BIMI. BIMI is a partnership of migration experts at UC Berkeley who investigate the social, political, legal, and economic dynamics of migration globally as well as locally. We bring together research, training, and public engagement. And by doing that, we aspire to inform, educate, and transform, transform knowledge to improve the well-being of immigrants and the communities that they live in. To know more about how we do that, I encourage you to go to our website where you can find our policy briefs on topics as diverse and useful as immigrant services, legal and health immigrant services uh, for immigrants in California and Arizona, COVID-19 and impact on immigrants, uh, indigenous Latinx students, and many more. I would also encourage you to look at the research projects that we are undertaking. Of particular interest is the latest one, which is called BIMI Cultures and Communities Project, in which we try to highlight what does belonging mean to different communities who come to US. We study the human mobility and the precarity that migrants face in the host country. And with this, I would like to introduce you to our wonderful moderator today. Professor Khataria Om. Professor Khataria Om is the Associate Professor of Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies in the Department of Ethnic Studies. She is also the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Om has received numerous awards for her community leadership and service, including congressional recognitions from Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and Congresswoman Anna Eshu. She is also the first Cambodian American woman to receive a PhD. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Um, for joining us today. And I will hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Hapreet, for your very generous um, introduction. And also my very, very heartful thanks to, to you, Irene and Bimi for the pleasure of moderating this panel and for bringing us together for this hugely important conversation um, in view of the ongoing conflicts and protracted refugee conditions in virtually all regions of the world, this topic cannot be more timely. So perhaps we can begin with just a few words of self-introduction from the panelists. Uh, their full and very impressive bios are already on the website. Uh, and then we can hear from the panelists about their professional journeys and their thoughts and reflections about trauma and resilience in the context of their work. And we hope to leave ample time for Q&A. So why don't we start with um, Ganesha? Uh, and a few words of self-introduction, and then go straight into the conversation. Ganesha? Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Ganesha Kaur. I'm a physician and a human rights researcher at Weill Cornell Medicine. 
Um, at Cornell, I'm the director of the Human Rights Impact Lab and co-medical director of the Weill Cornell Center for Human Rights, which is a student-run and faculty-supervised asylum clinic. In the lab, in the Human Rights Impact Lab, we really aim to advance the health of forcibly displaced populations through rigorous scientific methodology. We investigate, for example, chronic pain in refugee torture survivors, or cardiovascular disease in migrant populations. And then we aim to bring that work to the public. And our goal is beyond simply documenting trauma. What we're really trying to do is understand if we can medically, scientifically mitigate or even reverse that trauma. If we can rehabilitate children, women, men who have experienced trauma and reintegrate them into society. And so I'm really excited to share the stage with our other speakers today and have a conversation around trauma recovery and rehabilitation. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Ganesha. Uh, Sui, a few words. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, my name is Sui, and I am an immigration attorney. Um, I focus only on immigration law and I don't practice anything else but immigration. Um, this is my 22nd year practicing and I have um, a solo practice based in New York. I represent clients in all 50 states and I help many of my clients um, who don't currently have immigration status um, obtain legal uh, valid immigration status. So many of my, my clients um, are facing deportation, um, are seeking asylum, have been victims of domestic violence. Um, I also handle a fair amount of family and empl employment-based immigration, so basically sponsored applications for green cards and work visas. So um, my practice is very uh, broad, um, but I mostly work with individuals and families and small businesses. Um, in terms of the trauma um, that I come across in my practice, um, yes, this is something that is rarely addressed in the, in the immigration laws. And I think it's, it's really an aspect that is missing. You know, a lot of our immigration laws were created by individuals who have never had to go through the process themselves. And I think it's a topic that is rarely um, ever discussed. But thank you again for um, having me here. And I look forward to um, speaking um, and learning from everyone else on the panel. Thank you, Sui. Uh, Leah? Hi, everyone. Um, it's so lovely to be with you all here today. My name is Leah Spellman, uh, she, her, and I'm the Executive Director for Partnerships for Trauma Recovery, which is a nonprofit in Berkeley, California, right down the street from Cal. And we're not affiliated, but we love Cal and very happy to share the neighborhood. Um, so I'm not a clinician by training, but what we do at PTR is provide mental health care, case management, outreach, training both for clinicians and um, for social service providers as a whole and we do policy advocacy so my background is mostly in public health um, mm -hmm. and that's the lens that i bring to trauma thinking about trauma as a public health issue thinking about how trauma impacts communities and society as broadly as a whole. Um, but all of our clients are refugees, asylum seekers, people who've been forcibly displaced due to violence and persecution, and they've all um, come to the Bay Area. So that's what we do as PTR. Wonderful. And thank you to all of the panelists for, for sharing a little bit about your work and yourself. Uh, and welcome uh, to everyone to this to this panel. So let's start with the first, first segment. And, and all of you have such interesting lives and such inspiring journeys, you know, that led you to the work that you do. Uh, so let's, Ganesha, let's start with you. And I would like to start by asking you about your work as an anesthesiologist and a human rights advocate, you know, two very demanding fields to begin with, but that are not often brought together. Uh, in, in it. And so, first of all, how do these interests come together for you? And how do you navigate the physical and mental trauma that you encounter daily in your work? Thank you for that question. I think you're right that those, those of us in this line of work, everyone experiences a lot of pressure. It's, it's a, um, a lot of weight, it's a lot of responsibility. Um, I have a few different roles as you described. First, as an anesthesiologist where 
um, really, I, my training is to understand the body under stress. So when I describe anesthesiology to people, a lot of people don't know what anesthesiologists do. When I describe it, I, I explain that anesthesiology is sort of bringing somebody to the brink of death, but not letting them die, right? And so anesthesiologists are very familiar with what the body looks like under strain and under stress. And so I use that experience to understand what refugee patients and communities, how they carry that trauma on their bodies. What does it look like on the body? What does trauma look like on the mind? What are the real very physical symptoms like palpitations or chest pain, um, shortness of breath, signs of trauma that I see in my refugee patients? And then in my role as a, a forensic medical evaluator and a human rights researcher, my job is really to dig deeper and to decode those physical and psychological signs and symptoms of trauma and to figure out how to treat them medically, um, specifically in this population. And that always begins with the diagnosis. Um, so how do, I, how do I navigate that trauma that I witness? Um, I think you know, all of us could probably answer that question in a, in a different way. Um, for me, I think it's really important really connecting to the stories of people who have experienced this extreme trauma and, and suffering. I think just by witnessing, um, bearing witness, that can strengthen us. And so I think um, that has been incredibly important in both areas of my, my clinical practice and experience. And then I think also appreciating, um, being grateful for where we have and what, where we are and what we have. I think living in relative safety and security, having the opportunities to give back to really con contribute our expertise, whether it's in medicine or law or public health, whatever it is to be able to contribute back to communities that are just like us. When I see what's happening, I think most acutely, all of us can relate to what's happening in Ukraine. What separates somebody who is forced into migration from those of us that live in stability. It's just a, a, a very chance shift of government or an invasion or a climate event that tips somebody into that instability. And so I think um, within our clinic, within our research lab, Feeling that gratefulness, um, the appreciation for where we are is a critical component of navigating that physical and psychological trauma. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nisha. Uh, Sui, you have been doing immigration law for a long time now, right? And so what motivated you to be an immigration attorney? Um, well, I was uh, driven very personally to go into immigration law because of my family background. So I am the first person in my family to be born in the United States. Um, and I got to see, you know, the difficulties that my parents, my grandparents and uh, my great grandfathers on both sides um, went through. Uh, dealing with immigration, you know, the immigration laws haven't always been the fairest. And um, due to um, immigration laws that were discriminatory against Chinese uh, in particular, my grandfather um, was not able to sponsor and bring over my grandmother to live with him in the United States. So they were separated for decades. And um, because of that, you know, it, it had these ripple down effects um, throughout my entire family. Um, my grandmother and my father and my aunts and uncles were not able to immigrate from China to the US until the late 60s. And my grandfather first came to the United States, I believe when he was 15 years old. So, you know, for this, we're talking about decades where my grandfather had to work in the US and then um, leave, go back spend some time with my uh, grandmother in China, but because he entered the US on a merchant's uh, son visa, he was not allowed to be outside the US for more than one year at a time. So he was constantly shuttling back and forth, you know, trying to earn a living here, 
sending money back home to my family in China. Um, and this, I can only imagine how stressful this, this must have been for everybody, not just for my grandfather, but for my grandmother, um, who was left to take care of my, my father and my aunts and uncles by herself. I couldn't imagine, you know, what it must be like going through something like this. And so this always made a deep impression on me. And um, because of the fortunate, you know, circumstances that I um, have had, being born in the United States, never having to worry about immigration status. Um, I was able to be the first in my family to also graduate um, beyond high school and um, be fortunate to practice in a profession. This is something that you know no one in my family had ever had the benefit of. Um, my parents, when they immigrated here, worked very um, humble jobs and they um, scrimped and saved so that they can put my brothers and I through college. So this is something that I, you know, I don't think a day goes by that I don't think about it. And so I always had a natural kind of inclination towards um, learning more about immigration law. And um, that's how I ended up, you know, um, practicing immigration after I graduated from law school. I knew it was what I wanted to do. And um, I've basically been practicing immigration since graduating from law school. Thank you, Sui. Uh, Leia, uh, you also had a very interesting journey as well. What led you to partnerships for trauma recovery? And why is this work so critical, especially in this moment? It has always been critical, but especially, especially now. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there were a lot of threads that led me here. Um, and I apologize if my voice is a little bit shaky. I'm getting over a cold. It's not COVID, but I'm still dealing with a cough. So my apologies. Um, but I think the biggest reason why I came to PTR is because I'm a trauma survivor. And my own journey to healing has been a really long one. And it's very much been a team effort. Um, and so uh, I view therapy as an important potential part of someone's journey, but I also think that healing is really, really broad. Um, there's so many things that are in support of someone's well-being, um, and I certainly wouldn't be here if not for a team of incredible people. And so um, part of my impetus for doing this work is that I wanted to make that available to as many others as possible. Um, also within my family history, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor and he came to the US at the end of World War II. The Refugee Act wasn't passed until 1980, but had he come after 1980, he definitely would have been a refugee. And he came to the Bay Area. Um, so I grew up in Seattle and I moved here for this job, but in a sense, there's been a circle of, of kind of coming back um, to where he originally landed when he came to the U.S. Um, also, the area of the world that I've spent the most time in outside the U.S. is the Middle East. And um, I happened to be in Jordan for a year and a half during the Arab Spring. So I was there conducting research um, on a fellowship and um, there was what would be kind of during that period 1.3 million Syrian refugees that were coming into Jordan, which is only a country the size of Washington state, right? It only has about seven, eight million people. So um, it was very much uh, affecting the, the time there and um, kind of the lay of the land and how Jordan was experiencing the Arab Spring during that time. But it wasn't until after I came back to the US, to Seattle, that I started getting really interested in trauma. And I realized that having spent a long time either studying or living in the Middle East, I never once spoken about trauma among refugees. I didn't even know if there was a word for Arabic in Arabic for trauma. And so that to me seemed like a huge gap in kind of the way that we're conceptualizing um, the experiences of refugees um, and how we talk about political forces. And so that kind of opened up a gateway um, that again, helped contribute to one more um, reason for being here. Why this work matters so much now, I think unfortunately, 
providing mental health care for refugees is only going to continue to be more needed um, in the years to come. We've all seen with Ukraine that already 4 million people have fled the country. We know that with climate change, there's a very strong link between climate and violence and forced displacement. So I think the the skills that we talk about um, are unfortunately just going to be continued um, to be more relevant for our world as a whole. Well, thank you so much uh, to all three of you, because what struck me about what everyone just shared is, is the personal, right, that we bring uh, into our work. And so much of what all of you just said really resonate with me as someone who works on migration, but also as a refugee from the Cambodian genocide myself, you know, the corporality of trauma, you know, that, that you referenced, Ganesha, the fracturing of families, whether it's through war, immigration policies, uh, you know, the Sui you, you, you talked about, uh, but also the struggle, even linguistically, right, uh, that, that layer that you that you, you reference, you know, what is the vocabulary that we have to address these issues, you know, whether it is trauma or resilience, so, so thank you for, for those insights. Uh, Sui, I remember uh, just to follow up on your on your family story, I remember a story that you posted about your grandfather being scared of people in uniform. And so, from your experience with working with with um, immigrants and, and as clients, what are some of the stories of trauma and resilience that that, that stand out for you? I have so many um, stories. Um, it's really hard to kind of choose from um, from all of them to talk about, but uh, one client particularly comes to mind. Um, I had a client who was from Cameroon mm -hmm. and he um, fled his country because he was um, a political dissident. He was very active um, in speaking out against the regime there. And because of his activism, he was tortured uh, several times, jailed, detained. Um, he was lucky to uh, be able to obtain a visitor visa. So after he entered the United States, um, he knew, he, he actually knew what asylum was and he knew that um, he needed to apply because the, the threat to his life if he were ever forced to return to Cameroon was, was very real. Mm -hmm. So he came to find um, out about me through um, the City Bar referral program. Mm -hmm. And um, we filed an asylum application for him. Um, even though he had gone through so much um, unimaginable, you know, physical and psychological torture, um, I saw such resilience in him. I mean, during, throughout my representation of him, which lasted several years, uh, immigration actually did not approve his asylum application because he, he, did not file um, his asylum application within the one year deadline of entering the United States. And the reason why he didn't was because he was actually suffering from uh, pretty severe PTSD. Well, unfortunately the asylum office did not um, consider this to be um, an exception to the one year filing deadline. So he, he was referred into immigration court where he was placed into deportation proceedings. Um, and ultimately, the immigration judge granted him something called uh, withholding of removal, which is um, a, a different form of relief from asylum. But essentially, that means that he, um, you know, that Immigration and Customs Enforcement would not would withhold from removing him back to his home country because they agreed that he, you know, faced a significant um, chance of being um, tortured or worse. Um, it was a very harrowing experience um, representing him because ICE was very opposed to any kind of grant whatsoever. Um, but I just saw such a rare example of resilience on his part. I mean, even when he was struggling with PTSD and he was getting treatment from Bellevue, um, you know, I, I saw him during our, our meetings where he just, um, exhibited many of the symptoms, you know, inability to concentrate, um, feelings of overwhelm, um, hypervigilance. And for me, it was, it was a very, it was a learning experience because I had never encountered um, a client who was going through such symptoms. And I had to kind of learn um, how to work with clients who had experienced um, 
some of the difficult things that my client had experienced. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Sui. Um, Ganesha, um, your research centers on the experience of being other and, and, and of being a, a perpetual foreigner, you know, which are experiences that many Asian Americans, for instance, can relate to, right? So can you speak just a little bit about the trauma that those experiences engender and where you have seen resilience um, in your research as well? Sure, um, you know, where, so where, I'll start with the second part of the question, where do we see resilience? Mm -hmm. we, we see it everywhere, um, you know, we see it, as people start their migration journeys, as people go through those migration journeys, and while they are trying to resettle into a host country. Um, but I think we have to be really careful about taking that resilience for granted, right? Just because there is resiliency doesn't mean that that is the preferable route. Um, trauma leaves marks, even if somebody is resilient through it. I think a, a great example of this is um, what people say about children, right? Children are resilient. Children can, can uh, weather almost anything. And while that's true, weathering something does leave a mark, um, leaves physical and psychological imprints. And it can't always or even often be completely erased or reversed. So while we do see resiliency everywhere, um, almost astounding, uh, mind-blowing resiliency that we see and strength that we see. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily the, the preferable route. Um, before that resiliency comes treatment often, comes recognition, comes a diagnosis. Um, so one of the things that I think we've really focused on in our lab is figuring out what we're actually dealing with. So at the Human Rights Impact Lab, we're looking to qualitatively and quantitatively really document these experiences. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. We know that the prior administration's immigration policy changes, over 400 changes to immigration policy, led to a real lack of trust with the government, a total breakdown of trust with the government. So what is the fallout of that? What are the implications of that? We have the sense that there's something there, but when you look to, when you, when you are able to quantify it, we recognize that millions of immigrants are disenrolling, for example, from public benefits, not seeking prenatal care, not getting school lunches for their children because they're fearful, because they have lost that trust with the government. So putting numbers um, to those stories for, for us has been really important. And when we're able to do that, when we're able to really understand the problem thoroughly with that sort of rigorous scientific methodology, then we're able to come up with solutions and we can say, um, you know, how do we build resiliency? We, I can't change the trauma that an individual has experienced. I can't change the war or violence or persecution that has led them to my clinic. But once they're here, how can I diagnose, recognize, figure out what that trauma is, and then appropriately treat it? Um, so, you know, just like we wouldn't give up if somebody has, let's say you have heart disease or, or lung disease, I wouldn't say, well, that's it. I, you know, you have cardiac disease, that's it, we're moving on. You, you figure out how to treat those things. Um, and so I think it's, it is really important to, for us to focus on that diagnostic component. Thank you uh, so much for that, um, Ganesha. Uh, Leia, um, your work and, and that of your organization is, is really helping immigrants with trauma, right? So how does resilience manifest itself there? And, and what does it take to foster and, or nurture it? And uh, just sort of to pick up on, on what Ganesha just said, so what actually undermines it? And what can actually cause it to, uh, to, to, to be erased or revoked? Yeah, um, what Ganesha was just talking about, um, maybe about the both and really resonated. I think it's important to recognize that it does take extraordinary inner strength to survive in the wake of these experiences. And we also know that trauma takes a toll. 
Um, and refugees and asylum seekers are people who have experienced cumulative trauma in countries of origin, during flight, and upon arrival in the United States. Um, I think one of the things that's unique about the type of types of trauma that refugees and asylum seekers experience is that it's most often interpersonal violence. So this is hurt at the hands of other humans. Um, and unfortunately, we as humans continue to demonstrate our incredible capacity for hurting one another. So part of the healing process, part of honoring that resiliency is first and foremost, allowing people to return to a space of connection. How can they, how can there be someone or many people who are willing to hold space and to witness? Um, how can that process help people rebuild trust um, and reconnect with loved ones and other individuals in their lives um, and communities at large? Um, so I think that's that's really important. Um, things that can stand in the way of resilience, uh, just in, in terms of beliefs, I think sometimes the belief that uh, healing has to look any one particular way, that there's a prescribed journey to healing can preclude us um, from working in a collaborative way and really um, holding space and honoring the individual journey of any one particular person. Um, so I think exercising choice, allowing for agency, um, in addition to um, creating connection is re really, really instrumental and needs to be central as, as part of that healing process. Um, and another thing that can stand in the way is policies. So, you know, as I mentioned, people have experienced cumulative trauma from countries of origin to arriving in the US, we've all witnessed in the past several years how policies can exacerbate pre-existing trauma. So for example, separating parents from children on the Southern border, that added to profound histories of trauma that already existed, right? Um, and policies can also create barriers preventing people from getting access to services and care um, and doing that important healing work that, that needs to happen. Um, so yeah, both beliefs and policies, I think, can be barriers. Thank you, um, Leah. And what I take away from, from all of what you just shared is that the, is the importance of, first of all, acquiring a deeper and more nuanced and more accurate understanding of, of, of trauma and the larger implications of forced displacement, both in terms of particularities of, of, of those experiences, but also of commonalities as well, right? And and, and to use uh, what th that deeper understanding to inform policies and to hopefully establish better alignment between some of the stipulate policy stipulations and the lived experiences of refugees and forced migration. So thank you so much for that. Um, Pulling that thread further, I would love to hear your, your thoughts uh, in closing about the one, one specific public policy change or shift that you would like to see in place to address the trauma that migrants face and to nurture resilience as well. So I, I would love to hear your thoughts from, the thoughts from each of you. Uh, let's start with Leia uh, and then we'll go to Sui and, and Ganesha. Thanks. It's a really good question. Um, so with policy as a whole, I would actually love to see trauma used as a barometer to determine whether policy should be enacted or not. Um, so I think that sometimes it's still hard for us to quantify what is the human, social, and economic cost to a specific policy. Um, looking at trauma can be one way to assess that. So I can talk more about that, but I, I would really love to see trauma woven in more um, in policy as a whole. But as relates to refugees and asylum seekers, during the Trump administration, the asylum adjudication process went from a process of um, what's called first in, first out, or FIFO, to LIFO, which is last in, first out. Um, so the, the people who had applied for asylum most recently suddenly got bumped to the beginning of the line and their cases were adjudicated first. Um, so there are, there are measures right now to try and remedy this, but from a mental health perspective, 
perspective, having your case in limbo for five years, um, mm -hmm. awaiting a decision takes an incredible toll. Um, so I would advocate for reverting uh, to the previous policy of first in, first out. Mm -hmm. So if I may, um, Leia, to just sort of elaborate on this point, and what was the rationale for doing that, for, for, the, for that shift, right? Um, and because we are seeing a sort of globally protracted refugee conditions, right, on the increase. And so what is the compelling reason for, for shifting it this way? It's a great question, and I imagine that my uh, fellow panelists might have something to say about this. Um, the stated reason was to try and address the incredible incredible backlog. Um, so we have seen an, uh, an increase in asylum applications in the United States every year for the past several years. Um, and so to try and um, uh, adjudicate cases that had applied more uh, in the more recent past, um, that was one way, stated way to try and address the case. Um, the other stated reason was to try and address corruption. Um, mm -hmm. And again, we can all have feelings and, and experiences about this, but the stated reason was that there were a lot of people who had applied for asylum um, who then were working in the United States uh, without um, the ability to, without being granted permission to be here long term. And so that was seen as um, an abuse of the right for, for people to work um, in the United States. Um, yeah, that was the rationale stated by the Trump administration. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Sui. Yeah, uh, what uh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, Leah, I just wanted to kind of pick up from where you left off because um, uh, definitely, you know, what is stated as rationale has not worked out in the real world. Um, you know, this this policy that immigration implemented to um, adjudicate asylum applications that were most recently filed has has failed. Um, and I, I think the real purpose behind it was so that the immigration service could say that they are processing some cases in a reasonable time frame, you know, so that they could point and say, well, you know, not all of our asylum cases are pending and languishing. We are scheduling certain, you know, uh, applications for interviews. Um, but it's it's completely failed. I mean, I have so many asylum uh, applicants who have been waiting five years and or longer just to be scheduled for their initial interview. Um, and it's it's become so unmanageable because um, immigration has not stated, um, you know, they haven't provided any projected processing times for this tremendous backlog. Um, that's exacerbated by the fact that if an asylum application isn't approved, then um, an individual is automatically ref referred to immigration proceedings where they're facing deportation. And we all know about the backlogs in immigration court. So it's, it's almost as if the, the, you know, both USCIS and the immigration courts are compiling backlogs onto backlogs. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really know if I have a solution to this, but it's, it's a problem that is only um, getting more serious. And the other issue I would add is that there's such an arbitrary degree um, in terms of uh, asylum uh, decisions, both at the affirmative level with asylum officers and also at the defensive level with immigration judges. You know, the grant rates and the denial rates are so arbitrary and it's, it's so fundamentally unfair that one client who has an asylum claim, just because they're facing a particular judge may have a 10% chance of winning. Whereas if they were living in another city and another state, they may have an immigration judge whose grant rate is 90%. That just makes no sense to me, you know? Um, and I think this is a problem that has endured for a long time with both US uh, citizenship and immigration services, as well as immigration courts, that the particular person who's adjudicating your case may, you know, very well inject their own personal biases and opinions, and they don't always apply the law fairly and reasonably. Mm -hmm. So um, if I may 
ask you what would be one thing you know if you can uh, change something what would be one policy or one initiative that you would like to see um, change or in place uh, to uh, to to make these things better well i think at least one thing is um better vetting for um, asylum officers and immigration judges. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, here in New York, we are very lucky. We have uh, very good immigration judges. Um, that's not the case for many other um, cities. Um, and for a lot of the newer immigration judges have zero immigration background, mm -hmm. right? Either that or they come directly from being um, a trial attorney for ICE. Mm -hmm. So if you have come from that type of background, then I'm not sure how impartial you, you may be as an immigration judge. Mm -hmm. um, also in dealing with asylum officers, I've had asylum officers who were very well trained and reasonable and compassionate. And I've had officers who treated my clients as if they were criminals. Um, and it's not supposed to be an adversarial process, but many times it does feel like that. Yeah, I also think that many of them have very little understanding of the political situations that compelled exit in the first place. I remember when situations in Southeast Asia sort of imploded, uh, Cambodia in particular, with um, renewed human rights, uh, uh, you know, abuses and so on. I think, and, and I was speaking to some of the immigration officers, and I think many of them are very new you know, to this region, very new to, to these cases and have very little understanding of sort of the, the nuance and the, the context, you know, for, for, uh, for the petition. So, but thank you. Uh, thank you, Sui. Uh, Ganesha, your thoughts? Thanks. Um, I, I actually want to piggyback off of what, what Sue just said um, in terms of, of the um, random application of the law in some cases, in many cases. Um, you know, just as an example of that, we had written about a couple who had come from Cuba. Um, both were physicians seeking asylum after being forced to sort of do um, inappropriate uh, uh, medical missions that were really violating the human rights of under other individuals and um, were came to the border together, were separated at the border, had the exact same experience and story and reason for seeking asylum had lived in the same places um, and and one was granted relief and one was not. So I think when you talk about the random application of law, we see that. We see that in our um, in our in our medical clinic as well. And then again to, to something else that Sue said about instability, you know, when people are waiting for those decisions for five years, um, that is a, a period of intense stress and instability. Um, think about what it was like in the beginning of COVID when our routines were halted, when they went out the window. Um, you know, you didn't know if you could drop your children to school. You didn't know if you could show up to work. I mean, still, that small amount of instability mm -hmm. is so uh, problematic for daily functioning, right? Imagine a scenario where you don't know any day you could be given a deportation order, an order to show up to court, whatever it is, that is incredibly stressful and incredibly straining. And that stress has physical effects. It has psychological effects. Um, so that was just sort of, when, when Sue was talking about that, I, I see that in our, in our patients every day. Um, in terms of policy changes, What's the one thing that I would do? I think, you know, approaching this as a as a physician, um, I believe. I think all of us probably believe that health is a human right, and that every human has a right to their own body, to their own physical and psychological well being. Um, there are obviously many mechanisms by which one might approach human rights, whether it's law or or public policy or or public health. Um, as we've seen here. For me, medicine was really appealing because it allowed me to advocate for change on a very broad and also deep scale, but it also allowed me to treat vulnerable women, men, and children directly. Um, I can study chronic pain after torture on a large scale in national clinical trials, but then I can actually go in and, and treat that pain for individuals. So for me, it's a rare field that allows one to make a difference both on a public and an individual level. And I think there is 
almost in this sense, some magic to health in the sense that it is a safe space where we can rebuild humanity. And I think allowing migrants access to their own health, um, healthcare access is so important, is critical. We have to be maintaining the policies that we have in a country or internationally, we have to maintain those standards for migrants. If we say in the US um, that COVID vaccines are available to everybody, they have to be available to everybody. Boosters have to be available to everybody. And we see in ICE detention that they're not. And I think health needs to remain a safe space. And so if there's one policy change that I would advocate for, that would be it. Thank you so much, Kanisha. And um, before we go to q and I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for sharing your knowledge and your insights. And I invite the audience to join me in a resounding round of applause to all of you. So thank you so much. Um, we have a few minutes for questions from, from the audience. And I actually have two in front of me. Um, let me see, let's start with this one. And this is for, for all of you. Um, what do the panelists recommend we should do to better address migrant trauma in one, our medical training, and two, our legal training? What should schools and professional associations do? So let's start with that. And each of you can chime in or in any order. Um, I can start unless someone else wants to dive in. Sure. Yeah, it's it's such a great question. And I think, uh, yes, it makes complete sense to think about how do we build uh, skill sets and trauma informed work in these other areas, recognizing that it's not just mental health practitioners who are um, supporting refugees and asylum seekers, it is attorneys, it is doctors, it's this whole community of folks, and we all need to be able to do that in as trauma-informed a way as possible. Um, there are some really cool organizations uh, that do work with law schools. I don't know if they're um, if there are equivalents for medical schools, I'd be super curious to learn, but IRAP, for example, they are a New York-based organization and they um, work with law schools to teach law students in how to, in immigration law and how to support asylum cases. So <clears throat> we've spoken with them a little bit previously about incorporating um, work in trauma-informed care into that. But I think that for any kind of training program, um, there's definitely an opportunity to, to build in uh, that, that learning, so yeah. Thank you, Maya. Anisha, Sui, anything to add to that? I think one thing I would add is that, um, you know, in, in medicine, it, it is such a critical component of medical training to have exposure to real patients um, in the clinical setting, right? So you do your, your first two years and it's shifted since, you know, I'm, I'm ancient. I did medical school a hundred years ago. Um, it's, it's changed, um, but, but the, the setup is that you do a couple of years of textbook learning and then a couple of years of clinical work. Mm -hmm. um, in medicine, I think in some ways we're expected to learn a lot of skills on the fly. We're never taught how to teach. We're never taught how to evaluate students. We're never taught how to um, enter leadership positions, uh, management positions. Those are not things that are taught in medical school. But this is something that is clinical. And I think understanding how to manage the health of a migrant patient should become a core curricular component in medical school training, um, particularly as violent global conflict accelerates, as climate change accelerates. Um, physicians are increasingly going to be seeing refugee patients in their clinics. And if we don't know how to treat them medically, we're not going to be able to provide the standard of care. And you see this, we've done studies where we've looked at women who have um, FGMC, people who have experienced female genital mutilation or cutting, and 
their biggest fear of engaging with health systems is how they are actually treated by their physicians. Um, whether they experience disrespect, whether they um, are experience discrimination um, from their healthcare providers because those providers don't know what they're seeing. They don't know what's happening. They don't know what their patient has experienced. So I think it is a critical component of medical education to integrate a clinical curricula about refugees and, and their healthcare management. Thank you. Sui, anything to add to that? Um, I would just add that, you know, just thinking back to when I was a law, law school student, I, I don't even really know if there were any courses that I could have taken um, to prepare myself to work with clients who are facing trauma. Um, you know, when I started representing um, clients who were seeking asylum, I kind of had to learn as I went along how to uh, communicate with clients who were going through um, traumatic situations. Um, and I'm a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, but you know, to be honest, there aren't that many continuing legal education courses that even focus on this area. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a need for that. And, um, you know, especially for attorneys who do work with clients who are, you know, working, who are seeking asylum or other immigration benefits as, you know, victims of better, you know, domestic violence, you know, this is something that attorneys should be trained in, but I just don't really see many courses um, being offered. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have questions for um, specific panelists as well. Uh, and this question is for, uh, for Sui. Uh, the, uh, Sui, do you think that if immigration court were separated from the executive branch and become a, uh, a, a separate entity, that it would help with this backlog that you, that you referred to? Hmm. That's a really good question. And I don't know if I have an answer to that. <laughs> um, there's just so many issues right now with immigration uh, and these problems have exacerbated due to the pandemic. You know, right now we are dealing with a court system where um, there's no uniform procedure for how to conduct proceedings. Um, hearings, you know, um, are all over the place. Some judges require in-person, others, will only do uh, virtual. And it's, it's a never ending, um, it's almost like chasing um, and following up with a particular judge and their staff to find out when a hearing is actually taking place. Um, is it taking place in person or um, virtually or by phone? Um, this is taking up most of my time these days. It's just kind of staying abreast of what is going on with all of my court um, court cases. Thank you. Um, there's and this question actually is a sort of uh, I'll fold in two questions. And one is for Kanisha. What are the potential dangers that you foresee in creating a corpus of knowledge that documents refugee and asylum seeking communities trauma, right? And then there was a request for sharing a little bit more about the, the story of the Cuban couple and especially what were the arguments to deny asylum to one of them? Thanks for that question. I, I actually included um, the link to the, the article where we talk about that case. And there were several articles that came out of that. So hopefully um, you can track through it and see. I'm obviously not a, a lawyer. I'm I, I don't know the legal arguments that were used. I'm, I'm not smart enough to understand the law aspect of it. This is not what I do. And so I, I, I unfortunately can't tell you the details of that, um, except what, what is in that case that we wrote up. Um, I think, look, there's always one thing that I have seen and learned in my experience now in global health and human rights is that there are always always, no matter how much you plan, no matter how careful you are, there are always unintended consequences of positive action that you're trying to put out there, right? So for example, um, 
anesthesiologists, uh, physicians often go abroad to teach ultrasound skills to people in developing countries to help with things like um, peripheral nerve blocks or um, catheter uh, guided line, um, line placements um, under ultrasound. Sounds like a great skill, um, but what we know is that in some countries like in India, the greater the number of ultrasound um, trained individuals, the more people are proficient with ultrasound, the higher rates you see of female feticide. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, obviously an unintended consequence of teaching people the skill that should be used for good medical purposes, right? So what, what are the unintended consequences of documenting this kind of trauma? Um, I can I can off the top of my head think of a few negative outcomes from listing out what kinds of trauma people experience. For example, could that then be used to bar people from coming into this country, right? Or other developed nations? Could somebody say, well, we don't want people who have all of this trauma. So that's that's a consequence I can anticipate. But I what I know is that there are many other consequences that I can't. And so I think we need to tread really carefully when we do this work. But I think what, and I think what we need to do is always root our work in um, facts, in science, in hard numbers. I'm obviously saying that with my bias of, of being a human rights researcher. I think that helps us. Um, I think it helps neutralize some of that negativity and some of the unintended consequences. Thank you. I have a long list of questions here. And one is um, a very poignant one. Part comment, but part perhaps you may have some thoughts on this. I'm a refugee caseworker and being a refugee myself, the trauma I feel is like reliving my trauma every day. We need to develop a program to help caseworkers. Do you have any thoughts on that? Any one of you? Yeah. I would, sorry, go ahead, Leah. <laughs> I think absolutely. I think not just for caseworkers. Um, you're, you're highlighting an issue that I think is pervasive. It has to be for all of the healthcare workers, um, lawyers, legal professionals, immigration judges. Um, the the consequences. I know we often see CBP ICE as like not the, you know, not working on, on the good side, on, on the bad side, but there's trauma there too. Um, and if we don't address it, we will never be able to infuse the system with compassion. And without compassion, we're not going to achieve the endpoints that we want. And so I think it is absolutely critical um, that we, we understand and work to treat vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sumi or Leia, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think that pretty much encapsulates it. <laughs> Sumi? We're good? Okay. I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, another question is, what would it take for immigration anxiety to make it to DSM? I love this question. Um, so uh, just for, for anyone who's unaware, DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Um, uh, so this is the book that clinicians are trained in to use in order to diagnose mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a pretty fascinating document, especially if you look at it throughout history. Um, I, I think there's a way to see it as very much reflective of what society values and how we think about what is or is not a mental health disorder. Um, it's, I don't know, I, I view it as really important and also a very interesting reflection of who we, who we are and what we believe as a society. Um, so the way that we've talked about trauma, the way that we've talked about PTSD has changed um, in the DSM, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So 
I think for me, the fact that there have been so many changes in the DSM is indicative of the fact that this is a document that is ripe for advocacy, right? These things change because people speak up and communities say, okay, this isn't how we think about this. Clinicians stand up and say, this isn't medically useful. Survivors stand up and say, this doesn't resonate for me. This is not an alignment with my personal experience. And then these documents, these frameworks change, right? So again, my takeaway from this is that I think all of these categories in how we conceptualize mental health are open to change. Nothing is inevitable. Um, nothing is written in stone. Um, again, I think there's a huge amount of utility from the DSM, but I also think that this is a living document. Um, and so I would encourage you just to avail yourself of the nearest pulpit um, and get involved with advocacy, either by calling your representative or joining with a group to do so. Great. Thank you, Leanne. I, if I may add just one point, and that is it's, it's, it's the the question of how culturally inclusive, you know, these, these criteria, these definitions are, but also the instruments, right, in terms of the whole mental health, the, the intervention, the, the kind of um, what's available in terms of services and support and approaches for very culturally diverse populations. That is also another thing that have popped up, certainly in, in my work um, and my engagement with the, the uh, genocide survivors, uh, the Cambodian ones. So um, thank you. Sui and Ganesha, any thoughts on this question about DSM? Yeah, okay. The other question that I have is also very interesting, um, but it's, I don't know, and then your work, all of you, your work is tremendously uh, capacious, but this has to do with internally displaced people. So uh, it has to do with how can we handle trauma and recovery among IDPs, especially as they keep being displaced from one place to another. So I don't know if any of you would like to take that on since it may or may not be part of what you have been focusing on in your work. Anyone wanna take a? I think it's a uh, it's a fantastic question. You know, I think IDPs are um, notoriously neglected because they don't cross that international boundary, and so they're not protected by international humanitarian human rights law in the same same way. Um, you know, I think in some of the studies that we've done in those specific populations, for example, looking at the widow colony in India, um, a colony of, of um, people who have experienced trauma 30 years ago, over 30 years ago in 1984, um, have exper who experienced extreme government sponsored violence. You know, they are unable to really address that trauma because of the restrictions of being internally displaced in part. Um, you know, there are multiple layers of complications there. For example, how is mental health recognized um, in a specific country? How many providers are there? How many practitioners are there? Um, do those individuals believe in mental health um, diagnoses or treatment? But, but what is certainly layered on top of that particularly in the case of IDPs, is if they have been persecuted by their own government, um, how do you get them the attention that they need? And so um, this is a situation when we talk about layered aspects of trauma, you know, we, are, we don't even know right now how to deal with the ba baseline trauma. If somebody has escaped violence, is in a, a stable setting, how to appropriately deal with that. So I don't have an answer to that question, um, except to point out that I, I think it's it's very complex um, and will sort of be, if we can answer that question, then I think we have truly um, done some significant work in this area. Thank you, Ganesha. Sui, um, Leia, any thoughts on that particular point? Okay. Um, the, this one question is actually very, very um, important as well. It says this this caused 
means a lot to all of us who have joined here. How can we as providers or professional advocates in our communities, uh, whether big or small, uh, what can we do to support policy or help the immigration population? So it's about individual engagement. Anyone wanna chime in? Because this thing all seems so overwhelming and you really feel sometimes quite helpless, right? But there are things that, that individuals can do you know, to support this work. So in your respective line of work and areas of research, what would, the, what would be the sort of the individual community kind of an engagement that helps you um, move this thing forward? Yeah, it's a great question. And I wish I had a really good answer for it right now. Um, our organization doesn't have a super easy way for a lot of people to engage with yet. Um, that's something that we're building and I hope we will, we will have one day. Um, we don't really have it right now. But I think the biggest thing is just to stay informed. Um, and one way to do that is by joining listservs. Um, there are a lot of really amazing organizations. I know we have folks from all over, but wherever you are, whether it's the Bay or outside, maybe just start by Googling, what are coalitions supporting refugees and asylum seekers? How can I sign up for their listserv? A lot of those groups are going to have action alerts or um, action invitations for people. Um, where you can join with the other coalitions to hopefully create a bigger footprint. Thank you. Sue, so, any thoughts on this? Anisha, any thoughts? Sue, I saw. Oh, um, I'll just share what I try to do as a solo practitioner. Um, you know, I talk a lot about the work that I do and I post regularly on my various um, platforms. But most recently, I've been talking a lot about immigration on my LinkedIn um, community. And it's something that I've only started doing about two months ago. And um, the reason why I started doing it is because, you know, I haven't shared my story about my family uh, for a long time. And a lot of it was because of the shame, you know. Um, I had one grandfather who was very afraid of, of immigration. Um, I never really knew him. I only met him twice in my life. But from what I've been able to piece together from um, snippets that my father told me, um, my grandfather, I think, came to the United States as a paper son. And for those of you who may not know what this term means, um, a paper son is someone who came to the United States from China, um, usually a male. Um, and because of, um, I believe uh, in San Francisco a long time ago, there was an earthquake, which ended up destroying a lot of immigration records. <laughs> so um, there were some individuals who kind of seized this opportunity and they were able to, you know, come to the United States. Um, you know, on paper, they were uh, listed as, you know, the son of, you know, a US citizen, let's say. So. You know, I'm still trying to figure this out because so little, my family spoke so little about this, this piece of history of my family. But I think that my grandfather did come to the United States as a paper son. And as a result, he was always afraid of immigration. He was always afraid that one day INS would find out that he was not really um, uh, legally here. And this plagued him for, for basically the, the remainder of his life. Um, it's a story I haven't really shared with a lot of people. And then I, I just started thinking, well, there's no reason to be ashamed of this. You know, all of us came from um, immigrants at some point in our lives, right? And the more we talk about this, the more we can kind of dispel with this, you know, feeling like of not belonging and I don't deserve to be here. Um, and that's just something that I've been doing on my personal um, end, but you know, the responses that I get from sharing these stories is, you know, there are a lot of people resonate with this and they know that, um, you know, everyone has these feelings of not really belonging, right? And how, do, how can we be more inclusive by kind of like sharing our stories? I think to piggyback off of what, what Sue is saying there, you know, we are all individuals, right? There's only so much we can do as individuals, but what we can do is actually quite profound um, and significant sharing those stories or um, 
whatever small contribution we can make on our own. Um, there's a, a sort of human rights hero of mine, um, just once in cholera, who in his last speech before he was abducted and, and killed um, by the Indian government, shared a, a Punjabi parable where he describes how, I will not tell the story nearly as well as he did. So, so just, just to start with that, but he describes how um, darkness was setting in the world. The sun was setting, darkness was sort of taking over and all of the lamps in the village were fearful. What's gonna happen to us when the darkness sets? And there was one lamp that said, I'm gonna challenge the darkness and did. And seeing that lamp challenge the darkness, thousands of other lamps also lit up. And so, you know, for me, that is just an inspirational story of what difference one person, one individual, one story can make. And all of us here are all individuals with our own stories, with our own histories. Mm -hmm. Sharing those stories can be incredibly powerful. Um, I think can move mountains, can, can change the way that people see immigrants and immigration, the way that people see refugees um, mm -hmm. and refugee movements. And so um, recognizing the almost isolation of being an individual, but also extraordinary power of being that individual, um, I think is, is really important and is, um, it helps us, I think, stay stable and inspired and confident and, um, and help shed some of that isolation. Thank you. And, and uh, I know that um, the stories are so important. Uh, it's also really, really important to create spaces for refugees and the forcibly displaced, or those who've just been, who have suffered so much, you know, to tell the kind of stories that they want to tell. Because I think oftentimes there's an, this added pressure to tell the kind of stories that is expected of them, right? And the real stories remain hidden. I know that in, uh, as, as someone who has pretty much lost all of my family to the genocide, except for an immediate small handful, it is very difficult you know, to share right, the kind of story that is truly meaningful to you. Um, and that's also true for many of our elders with whom I work as well, that there's silence in the community, there's silence in the family for, 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 for reasons, right? So I, I think that it is also important for us to, 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 to provide that space, or to, to co-create that space uh, for true sharing of those stories. Um, I also know that many organizations, particularly community-based organizations, especially those led by and for refugees, they are most, many of them are very, very small and they do need help, you know. So for those of you who are looking to volunteer or looking to, to support this kind of work, you know, I, I think that um, there's opportunities there. And, you know, I'm, I'm working with a few of those organizations are that, that are desperately seeking support. So please be, be in touch um, with us. And I see also a reminder that you know you have internship opportunities as well for for our students you know many of whom are very much interested in doing this kind of work you know we would certainly love to partner with you uh, with you you know from organizations that have opportunities for placement as well so yes uh, we, this needs to be a collective kind of work you know and then and, and the kind of issues that we are embracing can only be done through this kind of collective endeavor um, so I also have another question which is uh, for, for the panelists. And this one has to do with uh, immigrant workers, both men and women. And the question is, what are the main traumas that they experience in the workplace after migration? And do you notice some differences related uh, that, that, that reflect their countries of origin, right? Related to their countries of origin? Do you receive many requests for help you know, with regards to harassment, et cetera? So, and what are the main barriers to asking for help, you know, whether it's cultural or fear? Anyone? It's a great question. Um, I think one story that comes to mind is uh, we were working with a woman um, from the Middle East who had, had um, gotten a job here in the Bay as a server. And because of her trauma, 
she couldn't remember how many water glasses to bring to the table every day. Um, her short-term memory had been greatly impacted. She had a PhD, right? It wasn't a matter of not having the appropriate training. It's the, the fact that trauma affects all aspects of our brains and our bodies. Um, and that certainly impacts how present we're able to be um, and how we can show up in the workplace. So I don't know if we've seen um, specific trends with people from certain countries or regions. I think what we see generally is how trauma manifests in terms of being able to concentrate and function and carry out daily tasks, including those related to someone's job. Um, but also on a policy level, particularly during COVID, what we saw is, especially since the majority of our clients are asylum seekers um, who may not yet have been approved for work status, their economic situation is more precarious and a lot were not eligible for economic relief during COVID, right? So I think what we saw was people who were often working in the service industry and then who got more, it, there was even another layer um, to, to COVID um, for, for that population specifically. Um, but I, I don't know of anything perhaps related to a specific country or region. I don't know if others have thoughts about that. Ganesha, Shui, any thoughts on that particular question? From my perspective as you know, somebody who trained in medical anthropology, um, I think it's critical to understand the biopsychosocial factors that can have an impact on an individual's trauma and really um, shift the nature of that trauma. So how does, for example, having a lack of, of housing or um, access to childcare or being able to put your children into school, a lack of access to food security, um, a lack of access to healthcare, how do those things then um, sort of worsen or, or enhance trauma? We've seen in some of our studies, for example, pregnant women who are in the immigration system, who, who have applied for asylum, will not engage with prenatal care. Um, you know, they, they just won't, they, they are unwilling to risk um, seeking those public benefits. And so that is not just worsening their own trauma potentially um, and that, that additional barrier, but also the multi-generational effect you know, on their child of what that, what that biopsychosocial influence might be of, of not having access to healthcare. So from my perspective, um, you know, looking at how these additional factors can influence an individual's trauma, their health and well-being overall is really important. Sui, anything to add to that? I'm just thinking about um, this particular individual who, you know, he only came to my office about two months ago and um, he did not have immigration status. Um, and he was so crippled by the fear of not having legal status, uh, the fear that immigration would pick him up one day. Um, he had been living in the United States since the 90s. And because he pled guilty to a crime that he did not commit, because he did not have a lawyer, was not familiar with the judicial system here, um, this haunted him for the rest of his life. And by the time he came to see me, um, I was able to, you know, figure out a legal strategy to help him hopefully get status. But, you know, sadly, he passed away from a heart attack, you know, right after my third meeting with him in my office. And when I spoke to his wife, she told me that the, the stress that he was going through was just too much. And he literally just passed away while working on the job and this just something it's just something that 
um, you know, I haven't been able to stop thinking about, right? Because he had just hired me and we were just about to start working on his, on his, his case. But it's just, it's, if there ever was an example for how, you know, immigrants are affected, you know, by the uncertainty and the fear, um, you know, this is, this is the, the clearest example to me. Just to, if I can add to that story, so we, you know, when we look at cardiovascular disease in our patient population, it is so clear that our patients experience things like heart attacks or strokes or risk factors for those diseases um, mm -hmm. just at, a, at an age that you would not expect it. You know, we'll have somebody who's 30 or 40 years old coming in with multiple stents mm -hmm. who cardiac stents describing the stress and strain that they have experienced as a result just of being a refugee and, and being in the immigration system. Now, it's impossible to draw a correlation from that, right? Or causation from that. I can, I can say that I see a trend here. Um, and, and so that's what I can share, what we, what we can describe. Um, there is definitely that trend. We see that consistently in our patient population. Thank you. Um, thank you to, to all of you uh, for your thoughtful uh, responses. And as a very, very quick closing thought, because we're rapidly um, coming up to the end of the session, uh, to this panel, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how you managed to stay healthy and well in such high pressure, high stress environment. You know, many of us working in this know this is a real, sometimes it can be a very fast track, you know, to burnout, right? And especially after you're doing this um, for, for many, many years and coming up against these challenges, what advice would you have, you know, uh, for, for people who are doing this kind of work, um, but are also feeling the challenges of managing the high stress that comes with this in any particular order. Any thoughts on this? I can start. Okay. So um, I, for me, I mean, I've been practicing immigration law for 20, more than 20 years now. It's It's been a real lear learning experience for me because when I was an earlier uh, lawyer, um, I think I tried to take on too much and I took too, uh, too much work home, not just like the actual work, but the, the, the emotional aspect of it. I would worry constantly about what happened to my clients. Um, and I would constantly question whether or not I was doing enough or working hard enough. And eventually I realized that that was not sustainable. You know, you have to really, at some point, know when you're doing your best and know that you cannot control everything, right? Despite how much work you put into helping somebody, you know, you, you can't control the outcome, especially in an immigration system that is so arbitrary, like the one that we have, right? Um, so it took me a long time, years before I realized, you know, that I, I have to really put um, boundaries in place and, um, also just be kind to myself, you know, not just be um, always uh, putting pressures and demands on myself. I think many um, attorneys have this kind of, um, you know, great drive and, and um, ethic and passion for what they do. But I also do see in a lot of my colleagues that sometimes, um, you know, they're on the verge of uh, burnout because they are perfectionists and they always think that um, they have to prepare for every eventuality. That's just in the long run, it's not a very sustainable um, way to go about um, practicing. Leia, thank you. Thank you, Sui. Uh, Leia and Ganesha, anyone want to chime in with our remaining three minutes or so? Quick thoughts. I completely agree. Um, and uh, I love that Sue brought forth the idea of perfectionism, because I think that really can be a barrier to us all doing this work. Um, I think another thing to remember is in any profession where 
we are holding space for other people, it's important to remember that we're all just human and to actively show up and choose this kind of work that's a very that's a very specific process and often people are doing that because the work resonates and it's deeply personal right um so i think it's important just to be kind and to normalize that it like we can all take specific approaches to try and separate ourselves from the work and create boundaries and turn off electronics at the end of the day and surround ourselves with loving people etc cetera, etc cetera. we can do all the things and I think what is important is to normalize the humanness of it all and to say, hey, maybe if we're affected by this, that's not a bad thing. That's a sign of our humanity, um, that we're feeling compassion, that we're feeling connected with whatever person we're talking to. And it's hard. We have to find our way through that. But maybe the part of the solution there is not, it's I think part of it is separation, but also part of it is connection, um, and and being willing to recognize that we're all we're all in this together in different ways, shapes, and forms. Thank you. A thirty second way in, Ganesha. If you have any additional uh, thoughts, um, am I healthy? <laughs> <laughs> am I? I mean, you're 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 asking such a a question that I think all of us could say. I, I don't even think I'm the right person to answer that. I think I think when we take on this work, it's just um, an incredible responsibility and burden. And, and, and if anybody has the answer to that, <laughs> please email me. Um, you know, I, I think it is, it's always a struggle. And, and I try every day to convince myself that I can't change the world. I can only change the path that I'm walking and make it a little bit better. Um, I have not yet been successful in convincing myself of that, but uh, recognizing that it's a work in progress, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, and that very wonderful insight um, to, to close with. So um, this has been such a rich conversation, and my apologies, we're unable to get to all of the wonderful questions and comments that were posted. I once again like to express my heartful thanks, and on behalf of BMIA as well, to the panelists and the participants who join us today, you know, for your knowledge, your wisdom, and your thoughtful responses and comments. And I look forward to staying in conversation with everyone about these important topics. So thank you once again. And I see Harpreet, uh, you may want to make some closing remarks. So thank you very much. Harpreet. Thank you very much, uh, Kataria, Leah, Gunisha, and Sue. I just want to say uh, on behalf of BIMI and our co-sponsors, thank you so very much. Uh, many of you have uh, DM'd me and asked about uh, recording and how you can be in touch with BIMI. All the links are in the chat. I'll just put the more link. Some of you have asked about supporting programs like this and more. Uh, I am more than happy to put that link in too. And with that, I would like to invite the faculty director, uh, Professor Irene Bluebread, to give concluding thanks. I just want to say thank you too. I've learned so much and I've been so inspired by all of you. Um, I think, as you all said, this work is so difficult, but it needs to be done. And I'm, I'm, I'm really honored um, that BME was able to create a space that we can have a conversation that bridges academia, medicine, law, community advocacy. Um, and this is the kind of conversations that I think UC Berkeley is particularly well-placed to advance. I mean, one of the reasons I'm so proud to be at UC Berkeley and part of BIMI is because we really try to bring together teaching, research, but also public engagement, realizing that we have a responsibility to go beyond the campus. So I really wanna thank our panelists. And as a very final thank you, I wanna thank Harpreet, who has been the driving force behind this event. And I wanna thank Dewi, who you have not seen, but is hidden behind that beamy symbol, who has been helping us with all the technology. Dewi is one of our undergraduates um, who recently finished her studies at Berkeley and who has been with BME for a number of years now. So thank you all, please stay in touch. You can follow us on social media. You can sign up for our electronic newsletter that comes out once a week. And we very much hope that this is the start of a conversation, not the end of our discussions. So thank you panelists. Uh, thank you Harpreet and thank you Dewey.